Hi, my name is Ronan, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about thematic analysis of qualitative data. And I'm doing this coming from science to a learning and teaching research environment. So just to give you an overview, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a lecturer in science in Dundalk Institute of Technology, and recently I've been getting involved in learning and teaching research. So I suppose that opened up new ways of thinking for a scientist. And while you wouldn't perform necessarily experiments, um, you still have to uh, design your interventions in with the same kind of design process that you might approach a scientific um, uh, analysis. But the data can be very varied compared to what we will be used to in science. So qualitative data, how we analyze that is actually a key skill. And in order to do that qualitative, we often look at themes within the data. So I'm going to show you a little bit today about thematic analysis of qualitative data, but also link to a video where we can look at how Excel could be used to excel in this area. Excuse the pun. So I suppose as a scientist, my data was very much um, evidence-based, looking at fact, there were controls, I had built-in systems, and with all my graphs I had error bars and statistical analysis and standard deviations, etc. And all of a sudden then um, I changed an awful lot of this because in 2011-2013 I performed a master's in learning and teaching. And I was asked questions such as, what do you think? How do you feel about this? I was engaging with a critical friend and a mentor throughout the process. And I had to, as I mentioned, master these qualitative research techniques. I was challenged to start writing in the first person, which as a scientist is a big no-no. So that was a real, um, I suppose I found it quite a difficult transition. And also I was asked this key word, reflect. Could I reflect on what I had done? And as a scientist, normally we get our results, we compare to controls, we build in many, many controls, but we verify, validate, and prove our, our factual results. And here I was asked, how did I feel? So a very different environment. So with reflection, a great quote from a, um, a Danish philosopher, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. So I guess that puts the idea of reflection into um, my mind with regards to how I can use my exposed experience to move forward. So if I think of the scholarship of teaching and learning, it recommends those in the teaching capacity and research to focus on the quality of their students' learning and understanding, while encouraging learner-focused conceptions with complementary associated practices. So if you think of these last points, these learner-focused conceptions with complementary associated practices, we have to pilot these things and try and see how they work and how students engage with them and if they're actually making an impact um, on the learning and that students are welcome of these approaches. So for that, there's lots of research projects that are um, started up and focused on this, this development. So I guess in science, we would think about doing our experiments in a particular way, how we would get the data and how we would do the analysis. So there's a very kind of, I suppose, similar approach here, yet very different systems and environments. So with research methods, I think coming from science is a huge advantage. We automatically have a very translatable skill set and mindset. And that mindset uh, is very set uh, on data, as I mentioned. So moving to learning and teaching, we have to kind of open that up a little bit. And controls in science is, uh, is a norm where it's very important that we don't disadvantage any of our learners when we're trying out new interventions or introducing different technologies. So the diagram on the right really, I suppose, is this idea of action and research. And we would perform these in science all the time, but here we're doing the same thing with regards to our teaching. So we would plan, act, observe, reflect onto the next cycle and so on. So one thing I think that was very different that I'd, I'd recommend you think from the forefront is ethical approval. So you have to start thinking forwardly from the design stage of your intervention. And if you have publishing goals in the future and you want to use this data, the ethics should really be, the approval should be sought before you commence your research. Um, and in that way, you'll be able to use your data in uh, various outputs. With regards to a study, uh, most studies commence with the needs analysis and, as I mentioned, obtaining ethical approval based on the design of the study. The various study maybe might be implemented and then afterwards there's evaluations. So the key evaluations often in learning and teaching would focus around survey, focus group and interviews. And then the analysis stage starts taking place before we start sharing our outputs.
So surveys, focus group, interviews, we can see quantitative and qualitative opportunities here. So quantitative, we can get from surveys so we can say what percentage replied a certain way or how many felt this way, where if focus groups and interviews rely primarily on the qualitative data. There's a lot of considerations to be aware of with this information. And people would often talk about the fear of leading questions that could be in surveys. Um, how the data will be coded, no disadvantaged groups in the situation, no data being lost. Triangulation of data is, is a vital aspect I'll talk about later. Making sure our data is valid, reliable, anonymous and confidential if that's been promised in um, your design of your study, that ethical approval has been sought, that it's representative of the actual information. Um, and thematic analysis is done in a correct way and that we don't introduce any bias. So there, there are some key considerations that you have to kind of think about when you're actually looking for ethical approval, that you would be able to address all of these and add more weight to your, your study um, and how solid and valid and reliable it actually is going to be. So I think with qualitative data analysis, you have to, um, without fail, without choice, I um, examine the paper by Brown and Clark from 2006. It's one of those absolute must-have papers. In this paper, I guess um, they have some points that qualitative approaches are very diverse, complex and nuanced, that the analysis should be a foundation method um, for qualitative analysis using thematic analysis of data. <clears throat> and that also um, we can provide core skills that will be used for conducting many other forms of qualitative analysis. Um, so those researchers uh, and all of us who want to get involved have to consider that. And they designed a six-phase guide to do thematic analysis, which they have found is key. Thematic analysis is a method for identifying, analyzing, and reporting patterns or themes within data. And it's widely used, but yet there's no clear agreement on what thematic analysis is and how you go about doing it. So, as they said in their paper, if we do not know how people went about analysing their data, or what assumptions informed their analysis, it's very difficult to evaluate the research. Um, so that way, clarity is needed. So what they did is they developed a six-phase uh, system. And that six-phase system is, involves certain aspects, such as familiarising yourself with data, generating codes, searching for themes, reviewing your themes. Um, defining and naming these themes and ultimately producing the report. So they have these six phases that I would highly recommend you engage with if you're doing any qualitative analysis. In a paper by McGuire and Dale Hunt recently, they said that the goal of thematic analysis is to identify themes, patterns within the data that are important or interesting, and to use these themes to address the research or say something about an issue. So this is much more than simply summarizing the data. So a good thematic analysis has to interpret and make sense of it. And following those six steps outlined earlier can really help that take place. So we published a paper recently, myself and Jerry Gallagher from Dundalk IT, referring to previous work um, published in the uh, AISH journal, that an inductive approach was implemented in our study. So our data was coded or categorized into themes without fitting into any predetermined coding frame. So we went here so that there were no um, analytic preconceptions in place, that we were very open to the findings that we were going to receive. So it was technically being driven by the data at each step. So in order to analyze different methods, um, if you think about uh, traditional ways, you could say, well, I'm going to take all the different information, I'm going to put color post-its up, and then I'll be able to say purple post-its are one, one aspect, yellow is another, green is another, and I can get them into themes. And I, I kind of really liked this approach when I was considering how to analyze data. However, I didn't have as many post-its as I wanted to offer multiple colors and so on. And I thought, well, is there any way I can kind of model this concept in a technology way? So there are quite a lot of different technologies available specifically for qualitative analysis. And people will swear by them and um, work with them very well. And, and I have no doubt that they're, they're excellent tools. However, in my case at the time, uh, we needed site licenses and the funding just wasn't there to provide that for everybody. So what I engaged with was something I knew quite well from previous roles and previous jobs, and that was Excel. So I wanted to get a very simple way to do the analysis. And that's what I, I, I can present to you today. 
So when we do this analysis, or any analysis, uh, it's vitally important to maintain an open mind. So be very welcome and accepting of any alternative views and sustain this open mind during all stages. But Brown and Clark also said that analysis isn't very linear from going from one to the next. You're often going back and forth through the data all the time. It's almost like you're reviewing what you reviewed. And as you go forward, you're always going back to make sure that nothing's getting lost and that you're harnessing all the data that's there. So it's a process that develops over time and, and shouldn't be rushed as, as recommended by Braun and Clark. So what I did in my study was I took my, my kind of flow chart of how I was going to do it here. And then I started mapping that to the thematic analysis as phases, as I said, it was in the paper by Braun and Clark. So you can see here the blue highlights are addressing, say, phases one and two, while the orange is addressing more to its main, primarily three, four, five, and six, and ultimately six and the yellow highlight. So I designed a way by which I could start using my system that mapped onto those phases and vice versa, and ensuring that I, w I was more confident in how I was going to uh, perform my analysis um, through the data. So this is something I'm going to talk you through how I did each of these steps using Microsoft Excel in, in the second video, which I'm going to link in the notes below, and I'll try and link here as well. So for example, just briefly, I went through all the data and I started applying color codes um, to how I felt each was fitting. So uh, for example, light green here might be a feedback theme. And then the great thing about Microsoft Excel, you can sort by color code. And so I could sort all the greens, all the blues, all the, all the different comments based on the different theme. And that way I was able to focus solely on the green ones and the feedback information that was here. So I went from 304 comments from a focus group transcripts and data, uh, going through that, identifying 10, 10 themes, excuse me. And then as I went down and down through the process, I was able to whittle down all the information into basically the top five key points and some key aspects or quotes that I could use in my output. So I took two focus groups and a survey data, and I triangulated all of this using this Excel approach. And the triangulation made the data more valid and more reliable. So all of this information um, helped me to identify patterns, themes, and draw conclusions from that. So this is just an example of what I had at the end for each theme. Um, I had all the quotes or important points of information, as you see in the, the larger box. And then I had my top five points from all of that information. However, this wasn't a very quick thing to deduce. This took a lot of, as Braun and Clark mentioned, going forward and back and forward and back, but ultimately generating each of these um, kind of pages for each theme. So I suppose in summary, we have a science skill set. We're able to plan experiments very well. So let's plan our intervention here. Uh, our learning and teaching intervention, consider ethics from the very beginning and embrace qualitative data. Use mixed methods such as using a survey, using focus groups or interviews, but embrace that qualitative data. Be very thorough and clear about how you're going to do an, your analysis before you even start. This has to be absolutely clear with each aspect justified. And engage with technology, be it with some of the platforms I mentioned earlier, or through Excel or through um, maybe another one that you found online that works for you. And I think I'd recommend enjoying not knowing where your data will take you. I think it's a, it's a nice path to go through information with a very open mind and actually see your findings come through as themes and um, some quotes or information to kind of back up those themes. But enjoy that journey because it's it's a very rewarding and you, you learn a lot from it. And finally, I just ask you to acknowledge participants. I think um, obviously anonymously, all of our interventions rely on the feedback and engagement with students. And I thank the students that volunteered to participate in maybe focus groups or surveys because without that feedback without those and um, those comments and so on I, I wouldn't have been able to draw any conclusions or learn from my teaching and learning interventions to improve the, the the culture of learning that exists within my lectures my labs and also within our department and school so i really want to do acknowledge that any participants that took part in any of my studies um, previously but i think it's a very important thing to do as we move forward so as I said to you, a great quote, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. So start reflecting and start moving forward, building on those um, reflections and improve your, your teaching 
based on the interventions research and the analysis of the thematic analysis of qualitative data. So this is a link here to the video resource I mentioned. It'll talk you through exactly how I used Excel to perform my thematic analysis. And I hope you find the video beneficial. It's a paper in 2016 in the All Ireland Society for Higher Education Journal, HJ, and it's by myself, Ronan Bree, and Jerry Gallagher, who is the e-learning coordinator at Dundalk Institute of Technology. So thanks very much for your attention, and I hope you found that helpful.